today, uh, we are going to start the David Ferry files. So let's uh, let's cover a little background on this particular file. This is a compilation of things originally uh, gathered by Jim Garrison. Um, you can see here, originator, New Orleans District Attorney. That's Jim Garrison at the time. Uh, this file wasn't released until 1031, 2017. So... This file was sat on for 50, 60 fucking years, right? 55 years, something like that. <clears throat> and for good reason. Of course, uh, this is one of the more important files that you will come across. Uh, it's pretty long, 428 pages, seeing as how we get through an average 20, 30 pages a day. We're going to be on this for a couple weeks. Uh, there is a secondary uh, David Ferry file that has about 350 pages in it. Um, <clears throat> some of it duplicated here, some of it duplicated elsewhere. I don't think we're going to go over that one because it's uh, n nothing in there that uh, isn't uh, touched upon, at least here. So, uh, my first concern is um, the first problem we have already. So, if we look right here, it says uh, total pages, 434 pages. Um, however, if uh, I look up at the left corner, I'm seeing that I'm on page one of 428. So there's uh, at least six pages missing uh, from what this should have. Uh, subjects, anti-Castro activities, Cuban, uh, Cuba Eastern Airlines, uh, Lee Oswald, post-Russian period, affiliations, garrison investigation, uh, F David Ferry Associates, and relatives. Uh, date of last review, 131.96. And so if between 96 and 2017, that's a good chunk of years that it just sat in box number 222. <laughs> so um, here's the folder that it sat in for all those years. So this article here... Um, I kind of debated whether or not I was going to read this, uh, but I decided I'm going to because this will give you a kind of a summary of what we're going to cover over the next couple weeks. Um, so if you're not familiar with David Ferry, David Ferry um, was uh, the, probably the most central figure on the ground in the assassination. He was in Daly Plaza. He was one of two shooters on the knoll. Uh, he was the central figure who was the key relationship between everybody in New Orleans, right? All the guys in New Orleans who were involved in the assassination, Sergio Arcacha, Emilio Santana, uh, William Seymour, Lauren Hall, Lawrence Howard, those, all those guys. Even uh, Gordon Novell uh, went to Dallas. Uh, Thomas Beckham was in Dallas. All these guys revolved around Ferry. Uh, obviously, Clay Shaw was in Dallas. Still working on proving that, but I know it to be true. So let's uh, let's go over. This is from the New York Times, February twenty fifth, nineteen sixty seven. Archives detail Ferry's travels. He told agents he was in New Orleans, November twenty second. Uh, by Nan Robertson, uh, Washington, February 24th. Documents in the National Archives added today details the account of David W. Ferry's movements during the week of President Kennedy's assassination. Mr. Ferry, who was found dead in his bed Wednesday in New Orleans, was a suspect in an investigation by New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison of an alleged assassination plot. Mr. Garrison says the plot was hatched in New Orleans and carried out in Dallas. That is very true. Very true. Secret Service records show that Mr. Ferry told agents shortly after the assassination that he was positive he had been in New Orleans on the day of the murder, uh, Friday, November 22nd, 963, and on the preceding day. So obviously he wasn't, and of course he wasn't. Secret Service men quoted him as uh, having said he was certain of his whereabouts because he had been in court in connection with a trial involving Carlos Marcello. The New Orleans uh, City Directory lists Mr. Marcello as the owner of the Town and Country Motel. Weekend in Texas, Mr. Ferry further testified... Uh, that he left New Orleans about 9 p.m. on the day of the assassination. 
uh, with two male companions and spent the weekend in Houston and Galveston, Texas. Federal Bureau of Investigation documents based on hotel records confirm that the three were in those cities that weekend. Uh uh uh, not so fast. The week after the assassination, Lee Fletcher, a porter uh, at the Alamo Motel in Houston, showed FBI agents a registration card with information that D.W. Ferry, Alvin Bobuf, and Melvin Coffey checked into room 19 at the Alamo Motel at 4.30 a.m. November 23rd, 1963. Uh-uh-uh, not so fast. The November 23rd, 1963 date on the card was written over a November 22nd date. Mr. Fletcher explained to the agents that this occurred because of the early morning time which the subjects checked into the motel, but he was quite sure the right date was the 23rd. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm going to say the correct date was the 22nd, that uh, Ferry did in fact get there, or people uh, uh, alleged to be Ferry got there the day before the 22nd, checked in, and what was left there but uh, Fairy's light blue Mercury Comet station wagon. This is all a hunch I have. I need to do a little bit more confirming, but I spent a lot of fucking time on this goddamn Galveston trip because I knew something was amiss. Something wasn't right. Something didn't fit. And we will get to all that. But, um, so let me continue. Uh, the record also shows the men stayed until the following day, Sunday, November 24th, but this conflicts with the card shown to the FBI in Galveston. Yes, that is true. Because simultaneously, uh, this party of three was allegedly checked in the night of the 23rd in both at both the Allen Motel and at the Driftwood in Galveston. And the funny thing is that David Ferry didn't stay at either one of those. He was staying in uh, Hammond, Louisiana. So who was staying in the two hotels that David Ferry was checked into, but didn't stay at? We will get to that. Hotel in Galveston. Mrs. Mary Dovery, a clerk at the Driftwood Motel in Galveston, presented a registration card with the information that the same three men checked into the Driftwood at 11 p.m. Saturday, November 23rd. Another clerk, Shirley Dial, testified that they left about 10 a.m. the next day, Sunday. The record cards for both motels stated that Mr. Ferry and his companions were driving a car with Louisiana license number 784-895. Mr. Ferry had told agents that it was a light blue 1961 Comet station wagon made by Mercury that he had bought in New Orleans several weeks before. Now, let me point out to you, a 1961 Comet station wagon light blue made by Mercury is an identical vehicle to a 1961 Ford Falcon station wagon light blue in color which will become relevant later on when we get to Hammond and how David Ferry got out of Dallas. But just note, they are the identical car, both made by Ford with different branding. This is like the peak of spycraft in fucking 1963, okay? So just keep that in mind, because in a couple days, when we get to James Lou Allen, uh, that will become relevant. <clears throat> Um, okay, so uh, the re the record cards for both motels stated that Mr. Ferry and his companions were driving a car with Louisiana license number 784895. Mr. Ferry had told agents that it was a light blue 1961 Comet station wagon made by Mercury, that he had bought it in New Orleans several weeks before. Uh, at the Houston Motel, it was listed as a Comet automobile. At Galveston, it was a Ford station wagon. Okay, it was. It was a Ford Falcon station wagon. The mileage and driving time between New Orleans and Houston are put by the American Automobile Association at 364 miles and 8 to 9 hours. Houston and Galveston are 50 miles apart, about one hour's drive. <clears throat> Dallas, where President Kennedy was killed, is 243 miles uh, and 5 hours and 15 minutes away from Houston. Long distance calls. While at the Houston Motel, Mr. Ferry made several long distance calls. Hotel records listed one call uh, and four to New Orleans. Uh, two of these were to radio stations WSHO and WDSH. Okay, first off, there is no WDSH, okay? It's WDSU. WDSU. The other two were found to today to have been to the Town & Country Motel owned by Mr. Marcello and the Fountain Blue, uh, at which uh, Mr. Bobuf's widowed mother, Eve Evelyn, worked as a switchboard operator. The latter call was collect. Okay, so these are the cover stories. Because this is nonsense. Mr. Ferry told the Secret Service in a long statement that he and his companions returned to New Orleans about 9.30 p.m. Sunday, November 24th, 1963. 
He then telephoned attorney G. Ray Gill, uh, by whom he is employed as an investigator several times. At Mr. Gill's suggestion, uh, not explained, Mr. Ferry said that he left New Orleans alone about midnight that night and drove to Hammond, Louisiana, where he stayed with a friend at Southeastern Louisiana College. The friend Thomas Compton did research in narcotics addiction, uh, Mr. Ferry said. Uh, Mr. Ferry said that he started back to New Orleans in the early afternoon of November 25th, uh, arriving about 3 p.m. He again talked to Mr. Gill, who accompanied him to the New Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, where he was wanted for questioning in connection with the Oswald case. The 16 pages of declassified reports on Mr. Ferry in the National Archives are part of the Warren Commission records relating to the Kennedy assassination. About 40 more pages are still classified by the FBI. The examined pages were declassified in September 1965, but until this month, they were scattered throughout many thousands of pages of information. Marion Johnson, the archivist in charge of the Warren Commission records, uh, compiled the available records about Mr. Ferry in response to requests from New Orleans reporters. There are 1,554 documents used in the Warren inquiry in the archives. Each document is several inches thick. Two-thirds of these have been declassified under guidelines drawn up by the Justice Department and approved by the White House. So um, that is a brief overview of the contradictions and the conflicts in various statements regarding uh, his trip to Galveston. So uh, he did make it to Galveston, but none of the fucking story about him going to the Winterland are true. Uh, he did not go to the Winterland. He was hiding out in Hammond, Louisiana the entire fucking weekend. And we will get to that as we cover this over the next couple weeks. There's a lot of shit to get through here. Okay. Um, this is the Dear Bastard letter. This is a key letter um, because uh, it is crucial in identifying the seaman who came in on the boat to Galveston bringing Rose Jeremy the heroine, right? So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and read this to you and then I'll tell you who it is. So dear bastard, got your letter from December 30th. Did you, uh, did you get my Christmas letter and the letter with the airplane pictures? You did not say, so I was not sure whether you got them or not. One of my flight students loaned me some sex movies for one night. It was two reels of 8mm film with some dude fucking this broad. He got his nuts jerking under her knee. She blew him. He fucked her in the ass twice and in the pussy twice. Uh, hope I can get them back when you get back so you can see them too. Jimmy was over. That's James Llewellyn. Jimmy was over when I showed them. The cum flew that night. I could have raped an exhaust pipe. They made me so hot. That cloud nine you sent was tops. What is it? Can you send more? If I if you have to pay for it, let me know. I'll send the dough. Bring plenty when you get back. Have you ever tried pills? There is a bunch of different ones. Some make you get on cloud nine too. Send me some if you can, except more than last time. Uh, the weather continues at its shittiest. I'm losing money like a motherfucker. I hope this shit stops soon. Still no business... Uh, for the beach to speak of. He's talking about his plane. I'm worried somewhat. Uh, we have to ask 110 an hour for it to make a profit. Some other guy, a big politician, came by and started talking to me today about buying an Aztec six place with all the goodies. Uh, double ILS, uh, three light marker beacon, ADF and DME and putting it to work. He claims he has the business to keep it going. I hope that he is right. Is he talking in code there? Who knows? Uh, when do you hit the States? What date? What date do you hit New Orleans? When are we going to get bombed, etc., etc.? Write, you bitch, and give me the word. And the FBI has this letter marked confidential for character evaluation of Blackstone only. Okay, Blackstone only. They were somewhat transparent in 1963. So um, when you, like I've said before, the study of relation, the study of Kennedy is a study of relationships. When you come to understand like who these people were to each other, uh, the, the pieces of the puzzle will naturally fall into place. Um, so when you look into this letter, there's a couple things I need to point out here. First off, there's a, there's a, this is a level of extreme familiarity. Uh, he writes to him as Dear Bastard. They're close friends, right? They're talking about watching porno movies and letting the cum fly. Uh, and he refers to Jimmy, right? So Jimmy, 
uh, who, wh- who, which Jimmy is there in David Ferry's circles? There's only one. James Llewellyn is the only person who could be interpreted as Jimmy. Uh, and so that means that the person who he's writing to about bringing the drugs and that he'll send money for them is obviously a person he is close to and they're both associated with Jimmy, right? So uh, there's only one person who fits this bill. Um, when you continue through the letter, you'll see that he goes, when do you hit the States? What date, what date do you hit New Orleans? When are we going to get bombed, et cetera, et cetera? Write you bitch and give me the word. So he's, this is a person who is not in the States, a person who is obviously traveling. And when do you hit the States, right? This person is obviously in the, in the military or in some sort of traveling, uh, occupation that keeps him out of the country. Right? So when you really come, become familiar with the Rose Jeremy story and the heroine that was coming in on the boat, um, it becomes obvious and this letter becomes key and this is why Jim Garrison put it in the front of his fucking file because it was that important is that there's only one person in David Ferry's circle who fits the bill and that is um, Andrew Jerome Blackman. Andrew Jerome Blackman was in the Merchant Marine at the time uh, and when you get further into the Galveston story, uh, you come to realize that not only was he the seaman who came in on the boat with the heroin, but you come to realize that the boat had come in on the 20th or the 21st, dropped him off. He ends up going up to Dallas, uh, in my opinion. this is the, see, the only reason I have uh, pegged him as being in Dallas is because I have one open slot for a, for a, a shooter spotter. Right. And then I have uh, Andrew Blackman in town for the weekend as he got dropped off by his boat and has to be back there Monday. Uh, This will also connect to Jack Ruby, who, um, despite people think they see see him at the police department and at the midnight press conference, neither of those was Jack Ruby. That was Jack Ruby's brother, Samuel. Jack Ruby had dipped to go to Galveston to bring Blackman back to his boat by Monday. And then there's some indication uh, in the documents surrounding Francis Fruge. Uh, who was involved with Rose Sheremy that weekend, um, that um, Blackman is, uh, they don't name him, obviously, but uh, that the seaman who they did identify, and they knew the boat and everything, uh, potentially the boat was called the Mataranga. Uh, that was, uh, congrats to somebody on the JFK forums who actually came up with that information. Um, but uh, it, it appears that the seaman was interrogated when he got back to his boat, right? So they knew all about him. And uh, when you put two and two together, there's only one person who could be this bastard that uh, Ferry is writing to. Uh, and this makes perfect sense because uh, the FBI was looking for uh, to use this for character evaluation of Black Stone, right? Heroin, uh, a black tar, right? So Black Stone, heroin, a uh, black mun, heroin, a uh, black stone, right? You see these words are all interconnected in the 60s. The FBI was very kind of retarded with their fucking use of uh of code names and shit so uh moving on we have an arrest record for uh leighton martins dated november 25th 1963 um he is arrested for vagrancy because uh the, the police when they show up at david ferry's apartment uh leighton martins is there and this is on november the 24th uh, it took me quite some time to figure out how he got back to the apartment, when he got back to the apartment, how he got there, who drove him there, um, because the official story that we're told um, and the story we're told by David Ferry, having gone to Houston ice skating and then drove back, is complete bullshit, right? So, But we'll get to that as we as we move along. But this is the arrest affidavit for Leighton Martins. Leighton Martins was arrested. Alvin Boboof was arrested. Uh, these subjects arrested and charged with investigation of subversive activities because they were found at Ferry's apartment when Ferry wasn't there. Ferry was up in Hammond, Louisiana, because Ferry hadn't made it back from fucking hadn't made it back to New Orleans yet. Okay, uh, Sergio Arcacha drove these kids back to the fucking apartment. All right, what is this? Uh, May twenty second, nineteen sixty four, to Joseph uh, Giarusso, superintendent of police from Sergeant Fenner Sedgbeer. Subject, the arrest of the below named subjects. One, Alvin Roland Boboof, white male, age 20 years, uh, residing at 3330 Louisiana Parkway. Uh, Leighton P. Martins. Oh, let me just stop and back up for a second. Uh, these guys were arrested for, like, suspicion of vagrancy while he was sitting in his own fucking apartment, right? So, uh, if you think you got it rough with cops today, um, no. In the 60s, they did what the fuck they wanted. They arrested you for whatever they wanted and just made shit up, uh, you know, like suspicion of vagrancy while you're sitting in your own fucking apartment. Hilarious, right? So yeah, we got it easy today as far as cops go compared to how it was back in the 60s. 
Uh, Leighton Martins, white male, age 18, residing 2427 Alvar Street. Uh, subject uh, number one and two were arrested about 1125 from 3330 Louisiana Avenue Parkway. That's David Ferry's apartment. Booked in the 2nd District Police Station with RS 14107 vagrancy under investigation of subversive activities. So they held him for vagrancy while investigating their involvement in the uh, assassination of the president. Uh, three, David Ferry, white male, 46. God, he looked like shit for 46. I'm 47. Uh, residing at 3330 Louisiana Avenue Parkway, arrested at uh, 525 p.m. from Tulane and Broad Streets, booked into the 1st District Station with RS 14107 vagrancy pending investigation of being a fugitive from the state of Texas. Investigation of being a fugitive from the state of Texas. Why would he be a fugitive in the state of Texas? That's interesting. It seems like they almost know something that they shouldn't. At about midnight, November 24th, 1963, officers R. Comstock, L. Ivan, and C. Jono, C. Niedermeyer, and F. Williams uh, met Assistant District Attorney Frank Klein in the office uh, of the District Attorney. At that time, Klein, uh, Klein began an investigation to the possibility of David Ferry being involved in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, which had occurred in Dallas, Texas on November 24th, or I'm sorry, November 22nd, 1963, by the hands of Lee Harvey Oswald. Information had been brought to the attention of Mr. Klein that David Ferry and Lee Harvey Oswald had been friends and associates in the past. <clears throat> With this information, at about shortly after midnight, these officers went to 3330 Louisiana Avenue Parkway, knocked on the door, and the same was opened by a subject who identified himself as Alvin Boboof. Alvin Boboof is still alive. He is one of the last people alive who knows exactly what the fuck happened in the assassination. And he's living just outside of motherfucking New Orleans. I think he's in Metairie or right outside of Metairie or the, the bitch is alive. He needs to fucking, he needs to, there needs to be a reckoning with fucking Alvin Bobu for sure. The officers requested the present uh, whereabouts of David Ferry and Bobu said he did not know. It was obvious that he was trying to conceal the facts. He was placed under arrest and the officers went up to the second story apartment where they found Leighton Martin seated in a chair. The subject was questioned and he stated that he was presently living with Ferry. However, he did not know the present whereabouts of Ferry. Martin's too was placed under arrest and the officers instituted a search. In this residence was found a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber, five inch barrel, six shot revolver, butt number 85392, cylinder number 96585, a holster for this revolver, a 22 caliber Hamilton rifle, a large bore English, uh, army type rifle, serial number blah blah blah, a bayonet having a holster, a flare gun, and a large quantity of ammunition. Martins denied the ownership of the items, stating they belonged to Ferry. Martins and Bobuf were conveyed to the district police station, and continuous stakeout was placed on 3330 Louisiana Avenue Parkway. Numerous locations in the city were checked in an attempt to locate Ferry. All were negative. At about 4.30 p.m. on this date of November 25th, 1963, David Ferry appeared in the office of District Attorney with his attorney, G. Ray Gill. At this time, he was questioned by Mr. Klein and Officer Comstock. He was allowed to see a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald, and he denied ever seeing this man before. I just need to point out right here, <clears throat> David Ferry was a central organizer of the assassination. He was one of two shooters on the grassy knoll, having fired the shot that hit Kennedy in the throat. Jim Garrison had David Ferry in his fucking office three days later. That's how close Garrison came without even knowing it right off the fucking bat. And the only reason anybody knew anything was because of Jack Martin who ratted out Ferry to the FBI for having taken a quote trip to Houston. That, that, fuck, this, this one thing drives me up a goddamn wall. The true identity of Jack Martin drives me up a fucking wall. Because I could tell you with certainty, at times it was Edward Suggs, and at times it was Jean-Pierre Lafitte. But when it was which of these guys, who the fuck knows? But everybody needs to read Hank Alborelli's, um High Strangeness in the Kennedy Assassination. It talks about this uh, pretty in depth about the aliases used by Jack Martin. So Jack Martin is not who the fuck he seems to be. And he's the person who got this ball rolling in the first place. 
Uh, he related a story of having left New Orleans at about 9 p.m. Friday, November 22nd, 1963, going to Houston, Texas. And the following day, going to Galveston, Texas, and returning to New Orleans about 1 a.m. on November 25th, 63. <clears throat> Ferry was placed under arrest after his interview and booked in the 1st District Police Station, as stated above, Colonel Garrison of the Department of Public Safety, Texas Rangers a different garrison, uh, was contacted by telephone by Mr. Klein and the details surrounding the arrest of Ferry were given to him. His office conducted a preliminary investigation. However, they were unable to implicate this subject in the assassination of President Kennedy. On November 26, 63, Captain Priest of the Houston Police Department Detective Bureau was contacted by telephone and asked to verify the movements which Ferry described relative to him being in the state of Texas. After several hours, Captain uh, Priest notified this office the result of his investigation, which corroborated the story related by Ferry, in that Ferry arrived in Houston on 11-23 and made a visit to a skating rink owned by an individual named Roland. Oh, that's semi-false. Uh, it was owned by Lyndon Johnson. And it was run by uh, Joyce Roland and Roulant Roland. Captain Priest was also able to corroborate Ferry's story as to him being in Galveston, Texas the following day. The officers have been unable to uncover any evidence which would link Ferry to the assassination of President Kennedy. Of course not. Uh, all the above described items seized from the home of Ferry were returned to him after they had been photographed and serial numbers taken wherever possible. District Attorney could be consulted in this matter. All right, so. We are now back to David Pierce Magyar whom we actually talked about yesterday in the Kerry Thornley files. This is the same fucking document. Why is it now in the David Ferry file? Well, because obviously Garrison had the heavy, heavy um, inkling to believe that David Pierce Magyar was the pilot who flew Kerry Thornley to Mexico City and back. Um, there's records of Kerry Thornley having gotten on the bus and done, doing this huge fucking like bus trip all over, bus trip to nowhere basically um and he goes ends up in Mexico City and all this stuff however the coincidence um the between uh David Magyar and allegedly Oswald having gotten their uh visas from the consulate the Mexican consulate in New Orleans on the same fucking date September 17th 1963 is just too much of a coincidence too much of a coincidence for me um, also, the same date that those two guys got their visas, um, uh, William Gaudet, or Gaudet, or however you pronounce it, he, uh, he got his also. He was uh, obviously a CIA guy. I'll, we'll get to him one day. I'll go over his file. It's really interesting, and it connects a lot of dots uh, between Oswald being on the street corner and uh, the incident with Jesse Kaur and John Corporan and WDSU television and leading to the interview and all that stuff. Um, but William Gaudet began the dominoes falling that led to all that stuff when Oswald gets interviewed on television and Gaudet also happened to get his fucking travel visa to Mexico on the same day, September 17th, that David Pierce Magyar and the allegedly Oswald, but it wasn't Oswald. It was Kerry Thornley. Uh, Garrison knew it was Kerry Thornley. That's why all that shit is in the Kerry Thornley file. I just wish fucking dummies like motherfucking Jim D. Eugenio, who've been studying this for 50 fucking years, could figure that shit out. God, I fucking, I fucking hate people like that. Guys like Eugenio and Greg Parker, guys who've been studying this their whole fucking lives and couldn't fucking solve their way out of nothing. People like that have done more damage to the fucking JFK research community than fucking anybody. <clears throat> David Pierce Maggie, our chief pilot, Trans Gulf Seaplane Service, Inc., New Orleans, Louisiana, advised he obtained a visa, a visitor's visa to travel to Mexico about September 17, 1963. He advised he departed New Orleans by a seaplane on September 24th, 1963, re returned September 30th, 1963. Um, so let me talk about the September 30th date again. September 30th, Oswald allegedly came back in the country like October 4th, right? However, that's complete bullshit. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. If you want to understand all this stuff, listen to yesterday's show. Um, but, um, September 30th is the fucking date that Oswald's return bus ticket was stamped, right? So, uh, th the official story people can't fucking explain why his visa was stamped return September 30th. Obviously, just like fucking Magyar's was, right? Same date. Same fucking date.
Yet, the official story says Oswald came back like October 4th. October 3rd, actually, into the 4th. Because October 4th is the incident in Alice, Texas with Carrie Thornley and, and Marina at, at the fucking radio station. Uh, so, yeah, uh, there's, there's, a, there's an intimate connection here, obviously, since David Pierce Maggio was friends with Ferry and Ferry and Carrie Thornley were intimately uh, involved. Uh, they, were, you know, they were the central plotters in New Orleans, setting Oswald up for fucking years in advance. Um, how Magyar fits into this, I don't know. Uh, was Magyar the pilot who flew Carrie Thornley there? Um, did Magyar know somebody somewhere and he was able to get the visas punched or stamped by someone he knew? You know, but he's connected somehow. Um, how, you know, this is a minor uh, kind of detail. Not real high on my list uh, of priorities. Things like this usually get figured out as you come to understand bigger pictures, right? As you come to understand bigger pictures, little things like this will fall into place. You'll be like, oh, so that's how he was involved because of this, this, and this. Because this over here makes sense. Now that over there can make sense. So this will fall into place the more I come to understand Carrie Thornley's documented movements through Mexico. Uh, Meg Yar viewed a photo of the Harvey Oswald, but advised he doesn't know him. Uh, nothing shocking there. Uh, here, Maggie R. downplays the relationship with Ferry. Um, yeah, I can move on. I went over this yesterday. Uh, he talks about Leon Gidry. He tries to offload the identification to someone else. Um, that's a common tactic I see a lot. Carrie Thornley does it like crazy in his file. And if you watched any of my shows over the past couple weeks, you've seen that. Um, Magyar stated that in regards to his applying for his tourist visa at the Mexican consul in New Orleans that he personally contacted the consul office in September of 63 because might recall the exact date he stated that no one was in the consul office during the time that he was there except for a white female clerk who issued the tourist visa to him he stated that it was about 2.30pm when he was in the consul's office to apply for his visa and that no one entered the consul while he was there oh yes this is oh yes oh yes 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 this document right here I have one of these, this identical document, all not marked up with my notations on it. And that motherfucker, ooh, yeah, this is important. Very, very important. Re, David William Ferry. On November 28th, 1963, Lee Fletcher Porter Allen Motel made available the registration card for the 23rd of November, 1963, which reflected the following information. David Ferry, Alvin Bobuf, and Melvin Coffey. Okay, so I, I said it before, but Melvin Coffey is Leighton Martin's, okay? Melvin motherfucking Coffey was in the Civil Air Patrol. He's a friend of David Ferry's, has nothing to do with anything. They just used his name as an alias because that's how the alias game gets played. So Melvin Coffey is Leighton Martin's. Just remember that. They checked into room 19, Alamo Motel at 4.30 a.m., uh, a.m., November 23rd, 1963, <clears throat> from New Orleans, Louisiana, and stayed until November 24th, 1963, around 8 or 9 p.m., they were driving a common automobile bearing Louisiana license plate 784892 or 784895. While at the motel, Ferry made the following telephone calls. Well, I, we'll get to that here in a second. However, I want to review this real quick. They checked in at 4.30 in the morning, uh, November 23rd, 1963. And it's about six hours from Dallas back in those days, right? Because they had the old shitty roads. It was brought to my attention uh, as I was doing my research, because I'm assuming everyone's zipping around on fucking highways. Uh, it wasn't brought to my attention until halfway through my research that they didn't have highways. And these bitches were driving back roads the whole way. So you can add a couple hours to every trip, um, which made a lot more sense to me. Um, but they check in at 4.30 in the morning, November 23rd, which is the day after the morning after the assassination, which means they left Dallas probably like 10.30, 11 o'clock, right? 10, 11, something but it's in that neighborhood. Um, what did they do between the time of the Tippett shooting, which is the last time we see David Ferry in Dallas? I believe David Ferry makes it to the Belmont address. Um, <clears throat> but that's a whole nother conversation. We'll get to that uh, another time. Um, but what, what happened to these guys in those couple hours between, so you got between the time, like let's say Oswald's arrest, let's say two o'clock, and the time they leave, let's say 10 o'clock. So that's like eight hours. There's an eight hour time period. I have no knowledge of anyone's activities. Keeps me up at night not knowing what happened in those fucking eight hours. So um, the time, the conflict here is that they, it says they stayed until November 24th. But we've already covered the fact that they checked into the Driftwood in Galveston uh, the 23rd about 11 o'clock. Right? 
So, um, the timing that they checked in to the hotel at the Driftwood is key. 11 o'clock at night. Very important. Um, because this, and we'll get to this uh, at some point over the next couple of weeks, when we get to Thomas Compton and his statements and his contradictions, um, we will discover that uh, one of his statements is that David Ferry shows up at his uh, dorm room in Hammond at 530 in the morning. Uh, which perfectly corresponds with the amount of time that it would dry uh, on the 24th, which is a perfect, for me, perfect correspondence between the time that David Ferry ends up checking into the Driftwood at 11 p.m. and then drives immediately back to Hammond, where he is seen the next morning and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, so David Ferry did make it to Galveston, but he drove there from Hammond, Louisiana alone, uh, and he drove in the light, bl light blue Ford Falcon station wagon, uh, and then he drove it back immediately to Hammond, Louisiana. That's what David Ferry did after he left Dallas. Um, but uh, the phone numbers. Okay, let's get to the phone numbers. Okay, so hang on a second. Before we get to the phone numbers, let's look at, these, let's look at the license plate. The 784-892 or 895. It doesn't matter which one. It's one of those, right? So I think it's the 892 number is correct. Um, that number, that license plate uh, comes back to his comment. However... Um, that license plate is also then again identified on the vehicle in at the Driftwood in Galveston. So there's some license plate swap shit going on because the license plate goes from the light blue Comet to the light blue Ford Falcon, which remember are identical vehicles with different branding. <laughs> okay. Um, and so Ferry switches his plate at some point in time. And then by my calculations, Ferry drives back to Hammond, Louisiana. And then the next morning... Sergio Arcacha and the two kids drive back to fucking New Orleans. And that's how the kids make it back to the apartment while David Ferry is still in Hammond because Sergio Arcacha drove them there. And then when David Ferry drives back in the Blue Ford Falcon, he does a switcheroo one more time to the light blue Comet, which is his, puts his plate back on it. And then I believe the light blue Ford Falcon, which nobody owned, I believe that was a rental that came from James Llewellyn, who was renting cars at the time. So, um... But unfortunately, there's no registration for the motherfucking light blue Ford Falcon at all, period. We know about it because of number one, it called out. It was called out over the radio um, in uh, Dallas when the cops show up at the Belmont address. They call out the light blue Ford Falcon is here. And then the light blue Ford Falcon is seen at the Driftwood. Um, and then when I researched cars, I realized it was the same fucking card, different branding. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant on the part of these guys. <clears throat> all right, so let's get to these phone numbers. All right, so the first two phone numbers, uh, we're just going to disregard those. Those have to do with calling Carlos Marcello at the town and country. Uh, the, the excuse would be that David Ferry worked uh, for G. Ray Gill, who was Carlos Marcello's lawyer, right? So uh, Ferry was not on this motherfucking trip, okay? So um, the, the calls had to be made to make it look like David Ferry was on the trip, Okay. Uh, what's important here are the two radio stations that are called. It's not WDSH, it's WDSU. Um, at WDSU, you've got a connection. The connection there to the CIA is Walter Sheridan. Uh, and I need to dig a little bit further into this, but um, in one of the Carrie Thornley files that we did not get to. Fuck. I probably should have done that one before starting David Ferry. But now you guys are fucked. We're going to have to wait for that one. I'll just tell you. Um, inside the Carrie Thornley file... Um, he brags openly to Garrison about how he has close friends in the radio business. Um, Walter Sheridan. It turns out to be Walter Sheridan at WDSU, not WDSH radio. Okay. And then WSHO, the fucking backstory to WSHO blew my mind. Okay. The owner of WSHO radio at the time that this phone call was made was none other than Hank Greenspun, the owner of the Sun newspaper in fucking Las Vegas. And I'm not even going to get into him today. We're going to do a couple weeks on Hank Greenspun and go over the Hank Greenspun fucking files. Because this motherfucker, holy shit, is going to blow your mind. Um, but Hank Greenspun owned WSHO. When you get into the history of WSHO, it was a fucking small time radio station um, that was like family owned, right? And the CIA wanted it. Uh, this is when I came to understand that the CIA was partnering with people like Hank Greenspun to collect independent radio stations. And I don't know why the fuck they did this. I really just don't know. Um, but this, when I dug through this stuff and this stuff, I didn't even find in like the standard issue files I found in like old radio digests, the story of this stuff. 
But WSHO, owned by Hank Greenspun, owner of the Sun fucking newspaper, um, he employed Jack Martin, basically, and they went and they intimidated the owner. Um, I think people got beat up and sent to the hospital. Like, it was a real fucking, it was really rough. But there was a hostile fucking forced takeover of WSHO, uh, ultimately purchased by Hank Greenspun, who owned it at the time uh, of that this phone call was made. So, super motherfucking important. Um, and I think these two, uh, why they're so important is because w, these two radio stations uh, are the radio stations that Kerry Thornley openly brags about having friends that, that work there and that he did some work for WDSU at some point. Uh, but yeah, those, th- that's important because to me that indicates they were calling there to contact Kerry Thornley because Kerry Thornley was involved in the Tippett shooting, um, then gets arrested out of the Texas theater, given the vehicle that he's seen at Mac Pate's garage. And then he dips out and we don't see him again at all. Carrie Thornley's out of the story at that point. Um, and so, in my opinion, these two phone calls were made to, to the contact of Carrie Thornley. Uh, that's the only thing that would make sense. And then that would make sense why Carrie Thornley bragged about it to Garrison. Now, all right, so, made one local call to MO4-3581. You will not find that number identified anywhere by anyone ever except for me um in going through garrison's files i came to find that he identified this number but i found that he identified this number because i found references to the building that this number was attached to but he doesn't connect them to this phone number in in the documents or the documents that he did connect them, they were discarded or destroyed somehow. But this phone number, extremely important. I'm going to tell you a little backstory. So David Ferry, as he's telling the story to the FBI when he gets busted um, on the 25th, he comes in and he tells this story. He tells them that he was interested in opening a skating rink in New Orleans. That's why he went to the skating rink to go meet with here it says Chuck Rowland, but his name is not Chuck Rowland. Um, he goes to meet with, quote, Chuck Rowland. And uh, then after he meets with Chuck Rowland, he goes to another skating rink. And he goes to a skating rink that he calls the Bel Air Skating Rink. Well, there is no Bel Air Skating Rink. At least not in Houston. At least not in 1963. There was, however, a Bel Air skating rink in Houston, but it was shut down in 1959. So let me stop right here. A couple things that can be inferred just by Ferry's statement that he had been going, that he went to the Bel Air skating rink. Um, Number one, that he even knew there was was a Bel Air skating rink in Houston means that um, he'd been going there way prior to 1959, right? Right? Otherwise, he would not know that there was a skating rink called the Bel Air in fucking Houston because it had been knocked fucking down four years at this point, right? So he went to a skating rink at some point in 1959 that he knew was called the Bel Air, but he tried to use that as an alibi in 1963. The problem is that after the Bel Air skating rink was fucking knocked down in 1959, they built another building on top of it that had a skating rink and a pool. And it was called the Gateway Swim and Skate. And that phone number, MO4-3581, is a direct number to the Gateway Swim and Skate. The number that used to be the Bel Air, the building, the business that used to be the Bel Air. Okay. And at some point, I will get to the, the, the fucking mind-blowing connection to the Gateway Swim and Skate. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the Gateway Swim and Skate used to be the Bel Air. The Bel Air is the alibi that David Ferry gave in 1963. So the implication to me is that he'd been going there for fucking years. Years. He had to have known the building that he went to as the Gateway as the Bel Air, which means he'd been dealing with the person at the Bel Air, who we're going to talk about in the future here coming up, not today, uh, but the person who he went to interact with at the fucking Gateway, which was the Bel Air, is ultimate proof that he'd been going to fucking Houston dealing with this person for years and years and years and years and years. And this person was involved in the assassination. So 
this document blew my fucking mind. When you maybe I'll dig out my copy, uh, my other copy one day, and show you all my notes all over it because this got shit all over it. Um, but uh, yeah, so just been this first fucking paragraph right here. I've been talking for like twenty minutes. That's how goddamn important this information is. Crucial, crucial, crucial. That phone number to the fucking uh, Gateway Swim and Skate. The, that, that person who worked there is the reason that for this whole trip in the first place, other than to create an alibi for David Ferry, because that motherfucker was was a shooter on the grassy knoll, <laughs> so he needed a fucking alibi. Um, on November 28th, 1963, Chuck Rowland, okay, so the name that they give for this motherfucker is Roland Chuck Rowland, okay? His name is not Roland Chuck Rowland. Uh, it took me a little bit to dig up his real background, but his real name was Roulon Chuck Rowland. R-U-L-O-N. He was French-Canadian. He's half Korean, believe it or not. He just died a couple years ago. Um, he's a half Korean French-Canadian. Uh, he was a famous fucking skater up in Canada. Was he a gold medal? I don't remember if he was an Olympian or if Larry Rost was the only fucking Olympian who was working at the Winterland at the time. But uh, that's uh, I'm getting off track here. But Chuck Rowland's real name was not Roland R Chuck Rowland. It was Roulon Charles Rowland. Um, and he was married at the time to, and they never mentioned this in the Kennedy assassination ever, never, ever married to fucking Joyce Roland. Okay. Joyce Roland. So goddamn important. And you won't see her name anywhere in any assassination literature. Uh, and we'll get to why she's important later, uh, as we get through further through this file. Um, so where were we, Mister? Um, okay, November twenty eighth, Chuck Rowland, blah blah blah. Interviewed at this time, he stated he was the man who introduced himself as Mister Ferris or Ferry. Contacted him by telephone, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and asked for the skating schedule at the Winterland Skating Rink. Mister Ferry stated that he was coming in from out of town and desired to do some skating while in Houston. On November 23rd, 1963, between 3.30 and 5.30 p.m., Mr. Ferry and two companions came to the Winterland Skating Rink and talked to Mr. Rowland. Mr. Ferry had a short general conversation with Mr. Rowland, but at no time did they discuss the cost of equipping or operating an ice skating rink, which is kind of strange because Ferry was going there for that purpose, allegedly. Mr. Ferry stated uh, to Mr. Rowland that he and his companions would be in and out of the skating rink during the weekend. This is the last time Mr. Rowland saw Ferry or his companions. The November 23rd, 1963 date on the Allen Hotel registration card was written over a November 22nd, 1963 date. Uh, Mr. Fletcher will explain that this occurred because of the early morning time, which the subjects checked in the motel. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. I don't buy that for a second. I think he did check in on the 22nd and left his Comet station wagon in fuck, uh, actually in Houston. So... um. All right, con to continue, uh, the following investigation was conducted by S.A. Uh, Carlos Kirby Jr. at Galveston, Texas. On November 28, 1963, Mrs. Mary Doveri, Clark Driftwood Motel Motor Hotel, 3128 Seawall Boulevard, Galveston, Texas, exhibited hotel registration card number 38068, uh, which reflected that Melvin S. Coffey, Alvin Bobuf and David Ferry registered at this uh, hotel at 11 p.m. November 23rd, 1963, and were assigned room 117. They listed their address as 618 North Pierce. 618 North Pierce is the actual address for the real Melvin Coffey. But the real Melvin Coffey is at 618 North Pierce because this is motherfucking Leighton Martins. Um, they listed their routine at 618 North Pierce, New, East, New Orleans, Louisiana. Records reflected that they checked out on November 24th, 1963, time not listed. So they checked out of two hotels on November 24th. And they were checked in simultaneously to two hotels. The Allen Motel in Houston and the Driftwood in Galveston. Okay. Super important. Mrs. Doveri stated that on November 24th, 1963, one of these individuals made a telephone call to Alexandria, Louisiana, and talked three minutes, and the total charges were $1.05. The telephone number called at Alexandria unknown. That's important, too. Um, allegedly, uh, Alvin Bobuf made a phone call there because of family that lives there. However, um, Clay Shaw's parents live in Alexandria. Uh, and there was a hotel in Alexandria that Jim Garrison spent a lot of fucking time and effort looking into. So there was, it's, it's odds are that this phone number is connected to the hotel in Alexandria that Garrison was like fucking intent on, on, on getting to the bottom of. 
I never got to the bottom of it. It's on my to-do list. Remember, there's 5 million fucking pages of documents. Uh, number 28, 63, Michelle Dial Clerk, Driftwood uh, Motor Hotel, recalled that the above three individuals checked out around 10 a.m. on November 24th, 1963. So they check out of the motel 10 a.m. And remember, it is absolutely not David Ferry. It's Sergio Arcacha Smith. Um, and I'll get to that explanation here shortly. Uh, the above registration card reflected that these individuals were driving a Ford station wagon bearing Louisiana license 784895. So they're registered in a Ford 784895 in Galveston. But the car registered in Houston was a Mercury, Mercury Comet. David Ferry owns a Mercury Comet, does not own a Ford. David Ferry seen leaving Dallas driving a light blue Ford Falcon station wagon. He's also seen leaving Com Thomas Compton's place in New Orleans on the 25th, driving a light blue Ford Falcon station wagon. So here we have the license plate swap stuff going on, right? Um, what is next? Uh, David Ferry. The following investigation conducted by Joseph Kilgore at Port Arthur, Texas. November 28th, 1963, William Frank Powell, Weeks Service Station, 3649 Gulfway Drive, Highway 87, Port Arthur, Texas, advised on Sunday, November 24th, about 1 p.m. or 2 p.m., three men in a light blue 1961 Comet station wagon stopped at the station. The motor was not running smoothly due to oil on the spark plugs, and they purchased a new set. So here you have the three men who left from the Driftwood at 10 a.m. in the morning. On Sunday... November 24th, having a stop in Port Arthur, which is up around the curve, right? Up around that start of the curve uh, of the Gulf into uh, into Louisiana, right? So it's uh, on the way to Louisiana. They're taking that, that highway in a light blue Comet station wagon, David Ferry's car, the Comet station wagon. Uh, they stop and they, uh, Frank Powell, William Frank Powell is there at week's service station and they get new plugs. Okay, so here we go with some descriptions. The, describer, the driver was described as a white male in his early 20s. He was 5 foot 9 or 5 foot 10, weighed 130 to 140 pounds with light brown hair cut short. One of the other passengers met this same description. Okay, so what we've got is either um, Alvin Boboof or Leighton Martin's driving the car. Okay, and the other one is the other, right? But do you see how one of the other passengers met this same description? You could say that about every single fucking guy who hung around with David Ferry. Every single one of them was about the same, you know, 5'9", 5'8", 5'9", 130 to 150, light brown hair, cut short. Like, you could never tell who he was with because the description was interchangeable. As is, that's the same, and that's the description of Oswald. That's a description of Oswald, too. So, and Buell Frazier. And a dozen other guys, William Seymour and Carrie Thornley and James Llewellyn and all these fucks. One of the other passengers met the same description. The third passenger was described as a white male, age 35 to 45. He was five foot ten to six foot inches, six foot tall, heavy build, dark hair. That's not David Ferry. David Ferry was five foot nine. Five foot nine, heavy build, dark hair. Yeah, that's Sergio Arcacha. Sergio Arcacha had to get back to fucking New Orleans to take them anyway. And how do we, and, and what's the relationship between Sergio Arcacha and Leighton Martins? And this is why they had to do, use the alias of Melvin Coffey, because uh, we know that the relationship between Leighton Martins and fucking uh, Sergio Arcacha was there because of the burglary at the Homa and because of uh, the stuff involved with uh, 544 Camp Street and the weapons that were sold to Inter Armco, right? So, um, yeah, so they had to hide the identity of Leighton Martins. Had to. That's why they used Melvin Coffey. But McAfee was interviewed and gave him a whole bunch of bullshit wrong answers later. Uh, maybe we'll get to his statements. It might actually be in this file. But, um, but yeah, so they had to use that alias there. Um, let me see. So Powell stated they did not disclose their origin or destination. These men watched television for a short time, believed to be after the actual murder of Oswald. Um, the murder of Oswald was on, yeah, the 24th. That's right. Uh, Powell advised they seem to be in somewhat of a hurry. He does not recall the direction they went when they left the station. Um, and uh, it says no other pages in this document pertain to Ferry and no pages um, 
no pages on something in this document are classified. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Uh, Andrew Blackman, uh, memorandum 24th, February, 1967, Jim Garrison. From William Gervich, investigator. Andrew Jerome Blackman, seaman. U.S. Coast Guard, number Z1215890. Following your request for information relative to Andrew Blackman, I am this date submitting this preliminary report. Andrew Jerome Blackman is a white male born in Greenville, Mississippi on 15 September 1942. He's 5'10", 160. Ruddy, light brown hair, blue eyes. So here we go with the same identical description. These motherfuckers are all the same height and weight and all this stuff. Then again, it was the 60s and people didn't eat fucking shit like we eat today. Not everybody was fat. Uh, last known address of Blackman was Route 4 in Mississippi. Blackman's a member of the Siemens International Union. See, d d uh, Jim Garrison knew Blackman was the seaman who came in with the heroin. That's why you'll find uh, all these documents together in this David Ferry file, because Ferry was the key key figure in all of this. The center of the spider's web, so to speak. Further information is being developed relative to what vessel he might be on now and his location, if not at sea. All right, so David William Ferry interviewed at his residence, 3330 Louisiana Parkway, when advised of the identity of interviewing agents. He was advised he did not have to make a statement, that any statement uh, he, he did make could be used in court of law, and he had the right to advice of an attorney. Ferry stated that at the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, he was very embarrassed and concerned over the lack of air cover provided the Cubans uh, who were engaged in the invasion and that he severely criticized President John F. Kennedy both in public and in private. He stated that he does not recall specifically what was said uh, in making these criticisms, and he might have used offhand or colloquial expressions. He ought to be shot to express his feelings concerning the Cuba situation. He said he never made any statement that President Kennedy should be killed with the intention that this be done and has never at any time outlined or formulated any plans or made any statements that, as to how this should be done or who should do it. Ferry stated that when it came to serious discussions, when the, president, uh, when the question of impeachment of President Kennedy arose, He opposed any impeachment proceedings. Uh, Ferry said that within one year prior to the first Russian Sputnik, he recalls being uh, quite critical of the U.S. space project and the defense program. He said he had also been critical of any president riding in an open car and had made the statement that anyone could have hidden the bushes and shoot the president. <laughs> Ferry also advised that he has been accused of uh, being a worshiper of President Kennedy because he is a liberal and strongly believes in President Kennedy's civil rights programs and fiscal programs. Uh, Ferry stated he has never loaned his library card to Lee Harvey Oswald or any other or any other person at any time that his library card, to the best of his recollection, has not been out of his possession since it was issued to him. So let me touch upon the library card. This is kind of fucking hilarious. Jack Martin again, this motherfucker. So not only does he rat on fucking Ferry, he starts the rumor that when Oswald's arrested, he had Ferry's library card in his fucking pocket. <laughs> Ferry goes into a panic. Okay? Allegedly, Ferry shows up in Dallas asking uh, Oswald's landlords and shit about where the fucking library card was. Uh, so... Uh, and it was bullshit. It was bullshit. It was, there was no library card. It was just Jack Martin being a fucking dick and, 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 uh, getting people to spin their gears over nothing. Hilarious. God, Jack Martin. I mean, uh, jump your Lafitte international man of mystery. He exhibited, uh, New Orleans police, uh, public library card number ML eight, nine, four, three, seven, bearing the stamped lettering an RPD in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Ferry said the letters NR meant non-resident. And the letters PD meant paid. Uh, he related at the time he obtained this library card. He was living in Metairie, Louisiana, and had to pay for the issuance of the card. The library card shows it was issued in the name of Dr. David Ferry, 331 Atherton Drive. An expiration date is shown as March 13th, 1963. Remember, the 331 Atherton Drive is the previous known address of Leighton Martin's. Uh, Ferry stated he has no recollection of knowing or having met Lee Harvey Oswald in the Civil Air Patrol or any business or social capacity. 
Ferry stated he has never owned a telescopic sight, a rifle equipped with a telescopic sight, has never used uh, a weapon equipped with a telescopic sight, and does not how to, uh, know how to use one. He also said he has never instructed Lee Harvey Oswald or anyone else in the use of American-made or foreign-made rifles or firearms. Ferry said that while in the Civil Air Patrol, he assisted in firearms instruction at Civil Air Patrol bivouacs for range safety only. Ferry claimed he has owned a Stinson 150 blue and white single engine four passenger monoplane registration number 8293K and that his that this plane has not been airworthy since the license expired in the spring of 1962. Ferry stated he has never flown Lee Harvey Oswald to Dallas, Texas or any other town in Texas at any time. <clears throat> he said that the only planes he would have access to would be rental planes. Lois Weston, Aircraft Registration Branch, Federal Aviation Agency, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, reviewed her files under registration number 8293K and advised this registration number is issued to a Stinson 150 aircraft with serial number 1081293. This aircraft was registered to David Ferry, 13 New Clay Street, uh, Canada, Louisiana, on May 8, 1947. The latest registration records and file list Ferry as a registered owner. His last address recorded in the file is 704 Airline Park Boulevard, Canada, Louisiana. Western uh, Weston advised that an application for airworthiness certificate dated April 7, 1961 is contained in the file and the certificate, according to regulations, would be valid as long as the aircraft is operated in accordance with operating regulations. There was no particular expiration date listed with this certificate and there was no information available in the FAA files which would, be, which would indicate that this aircraft is no longer airworthy. Weston added, however, that in the event that Ferry had not complied with the FAA regulations, his aircraft uh, would not be airworthy, but it is not necessary that this information be recorded in the FAA files. So this uh, same document is in the Kerry Thornley file that we went over yesterday. So Garrison obviously was making connections here that he didn't outright state. And you can tell this just by how he grouped his files together. You know, I gotta wonder, when shit comes up this fucking fuzzy, is it this fuzzy on purpose? Really? So, March 1st, 69, says Jones Harris. Jones Harris hasn't seen Nagel for a something. Um, for a month? Yeah, for a month. Hasn't seen or R-A-G-E-L-L or Nagel, or N-A-G. That's, um... What's his name? Nagel. Uh, if you're not if you're not like a real Kennedy nerd, you're not going to know this name. But Richard Case Nagel was another CIA slash mafia low level spook who got himself arrested because he didn't want to be involved with the assassination. And he made a bunch of statements and implicating a bunch of people. Are his statements true? To the best of his knowledge. But the member, these motherfuckers are like um, so compartmentalized that they don't know shit. Like even when they tell the truth, they're not telling the truth because they don't know the whole truth. Right. So I think that applies to Nagel, just like it applies to um, Jules Rico Kimball. Um, so, all right, so let me try to make it through this. Um, God, it's hard to read. Uh, last word from him uh, was cards. Uh, Nagel didn't work out his deal with CIA. Nagel gives Harris following, uh, following names. Uh, like... Uh, something s hay or nay jr john galette jason signs um something fitman but that first name has been redacted cia now um yeah that name is redacted so there's obviously i don't want you to know who the fuck that was um in csak uh x navy x commander nagel saw at um whatever the code that is. Chinese type CIA. Nagel gave Harris info re-following to who he said had a hand in Dallas been working for an outfit called Movement to Free Cuba headed by Tracy... Navrest, Havrest, something like that. Um, okay, and the names that he gave who were allegedly uh, involved in in Dallas. Leopoldo, okay, okay, here we go. 
uh, Leopoldo, Caucasian Mexican. He's talking about Lawrence Howard. Um, 27, 28 years old, 200 pounds, 5'10 or 5'11, black hair, heavy build. Leopoldo. So that, uh, duh. Um, he gave the name of Leopoldo for this guy. And Leopoldo was the name of the fucking alias that was given at the Silvia, Silvia Odios, right? So, of course, that was Lawrence Howard, Lauren Hall, and William Seymour. Um, so, see, this is some corroboration, right? This is some corroboration from uh, Richard Case Nagel that indicates to me that he knew what he was talking about, right? So just by giving that name Leopoldo, um, and see, he says Caucasian Mexican, right? I don't know why the fuck they do that, but the FBI has always had that in their classification, even to this very day. Like, it's white male and then Hispanic, even if you're fucking black as fuck. Uh, it's really weird how they do that. Um, Wrangle. Uh, Wrangle's another one. Male Caucasian or Cuban, Mexican 28, 180 pounds, 5'11", black hair, hazel eyes. I'd be willing to bet that's fucking Lauren Hall, just because of the association with Leopoldo. <coughs> Leon Oswald, uh, male Caucasian, Americans 24, 25, 150 pounds, 5'8 or 5'9, alive on September uh, 16th or 14th, or September 14th or 15th, 1963, not alive after. What is that date? Is that a September also? Not alive after September 19th, 1963. So this is another name that Richard Case Nagel is giving as cor to corroborate his story. He gave a good name, Leon Oswald. However, um, he might be giving a description of uh, William Seymour. He might have just come in contact with those three guys at some point, which would make sense because William Seymour was the other person who was impersonating Oswald, who was mistaken for Oswald everywhere. And it says, uh, Nagel left, uh, M O for L A left Missouri for La Los Angeles, September 16th, 1963. Is that M O or New Orleans? Is that N O Nagel left New Orleans for Los Angeles, September 16th, 1963. The next day is when the visa was issued connection here. Who knows? What does that say? Plots or ploys? 163, uh, Miami. 1963, June, L.A., Beverly Hilton. 1963, September, Washington. September 26th, scheduled. Hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, why does this say, uh, there's obviously a line missing here that we can't see, and then it says, Marina's file in San Antonio in April 1963. Hmm. Connection there? Why are they mentioning Marina in Richard Case Nagel's file? Interesting, huh? Witnesses, witnesses to what? Fairy is underlined here. Uh, let's see if we can figure out what's important. Um, L. Anderson, William Basco, hmm? Andy Blackman. Okay, can tell something of community reputation. Also, personal contact. Can tell how he was in communicado and intimidated to frame the defendant. Hmm. This, I believe, is going to be in reference to David Ferry's hearings uh, surrounding um, his Eastern Airlines termination. Uh, he was terminated from Eastern Airlines for doing gay shit on the planes, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um and uh or unauthorized flights or something fucking weird but something involving kids uh and so i believe this is possible a witness list against him here um and they're trying to let me see is this for the prosecution or the defense um yeah this is possibly a defense document 
but the uh, the incident was pretty important. It changed Ferry's life because he had been a pilot with Eastern Airlines on and off for like a decade. Uh, and I think that he was using his Eastern Airlines pilot status to do covert shit. <laughs> um, let me see. Leighton Martins can tell what teenager think, what defendant does for them against Crochet and can testify on conspiracy. So Crochet is involved in the Al Shermi molestation kidnapping case that Ferry was involved in. Uh, that case against Ferry, which fucking charges that should have put him away for life, uh, did this, they just got, they got dismissed. Um, I think he got found not guilty of some and some got dismissed. So, yeah, he had people pulling strings for him because he was guilty as hell. Mrs. Martins can tell what mothers think about the defendant. Uh, she gets mixed up. Uh, this is more character based. Um, this stuff here is all character related. Garrison must have got that for character substance purposes. Um, <clears throat> all right. To Jim Garrison from William Gervich, investigator, Dallas, Texas, February 2nd to 4th, uh, 1967. Something, something, Thursday, 2nd, February 1967, in company with uh, Lynn Loiselle, the other investigator, District Parish, dist uh, yeah, Parish District Attorney's Office, departed from New Orleans International Airport on Delta Airlines Flight 804, destined for Dallas, Texas. This flight was scheduled to depart at 6.30 p.m., was approximately one hour late. Arriving in Dallas, Loiselle and I rented an automobile from Avis Car Rental, Leaving there approximately 9, 10 p.m., we proceeded to the Stemmons Freeway and registered in the Howard Johnson Motel, occupying room 205. Uh, on the morning of Friday, the 3rd of February, we proceeded direct to the records division of the Dallas Police Department. There we checked for any records of arrest, traffic, misdemeanor, and felonies for the following subjects. David William Ferry, Sergio Arcacha Smith, and Sergio Arcacha, same guy, obviously, Caridad Lopez, Emilio Santana, Richard Davis, and uh, Campo, no other name available. See, Garrison knew who was what, for the most part. He knew Ferry was there. He knew Sir Jericacha Smith was there. Caridad Lopez is not going to have any relevance. Possibly used as an alias, which is what draw his attention. Uh, Emilio Santana, obviously he knew he was one of the shooters too. He was definitely in Dallas. Um, Ricardo Davis, man, he's one of these guys who constantly pops up on the outskirts of everything. But I can't link him to anything. That's how you know when you're a good CIA agent. <laughs> um, Campo, I think, was just ended up being an alias uh, attached to Emilio Santana. I think they ended up determining that later on. Results of this search were negative. There were very few files under Campo and only two were not juveniles. These two records were photostatted and are attached to this report. Uh, concluding, tr uh, we proceeded to the daily, uh, to the Dallas County Sheriff's office and made similar search results uh, where they're negative. From there, we proceeded elsewhere to conduct uh, research work on these subjects record showed in 1966 when Caridad Lopez resided at 3218 Harlandale Street, Dallas, Texas they also revealed that she was a widow, actually divorced and was employed by uh, Fashions I can't really see what that is uh, of Texas Inc. as a machine operator her telephone number was listed as uh, blah 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 in 1965 this subject was listed as residing of 2822 Idaho Street in Dallas there were no listings for the years 64 to uh, 61 it was also determined that Fashions was a manufacturer of children's clothing this firm owned by Lloyd Shin the factory was formerly located in 1911 North Lamar ooh 1911 North Lamar. Hmm. North Lamar. We'll get to that one day. At a branch, uh, 2219 Commerce Street, they are presently located at 1825 North Beckley Avenue, have no branch offices. According to the records, 3210 Harlandale Street was occupied by the following persons for the years indicated. Larry Pope, a carpenter. 
in 65 and 64 and 63 austin grant an artist for capital registration in 1962 carlos t sanderson employed by oak cliff brace company i also visited the offices of the american guild of variety artists okay this is great uh, 1500 Jackson Street, Dallas, Texas, seeking information about a hypnotist who reportedly worked in Jack Ruby's Carousel Lounge in the Dallas area in November 1963. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the AVGA. Let me finish the paragraph and I'll get back to it. So Mr. Martin Cavanaugh, branch manager, was cooperative but was little help. He directed me to Mr. C.A. Dolan. It says Dolson, but it was Dolan. Uh, owner of the theatrical agency and orchestra service in room 500 of the same address. These are mob guys. Uh, going through his files, he could find no hypnotist, magician, or similar act in the Dallas area. Of course he couldn't. Okay, so the AVGA was like a fucking union sort of booking agency kind of organization that dealt with if you wanted to get entertainers into your fucking club, you could go to them and book them. And it would kind of function like a union, but kind of a booking agency. And it was completely run by the fucking mob. <laughs> okay so like rose Jeremy and all this shit when she went on tour and went to fucking to go fuck dudes in miami and in new orleans and all this stuff that was all coordinated through the agva which was run by a guy named dolan who was um connected to jack ruby and had a place in oak cliff and all and the whole nine yards right so yeah uh corrupt mob shit um, visiting 3218 Harlandale Street, I learned that Cara Dead Lopez had moved and was residing at 2022 Idaho, which was closed by uh, proceeding, uh, which was close, which was close by. Proceeding there, I was met with a Spanish speaking woman who said that she was the mother of Cara Dead Lopez and that her daughter would be home in about 30 minutes. While awaiting the daughter's arrival, I conversed with the mother, Carmen, looks like Zaldivar, uh, Salazar. And his father, Francisco Salazar, both of whom dropped in separately during my interview and are related to Subject Lopez. All three cooperated in answering questions about Caridad Lopez. Uh, the Salazars live at 3111 Harlandale Street. When Subject Lopez arrived, she offered the following information. She was born November 20th, 1922 in Cuba. She's five foot four, has dark brown hair and hazel eyes. I did not ask her weight, nor did she offer it. She is presently employed at Dallas uh, for, uh, for Dallas, an optical company whose offices are on the Stebbins Freeway. Um, she said she worked for there for two weeks. Uh, her full name is Caridad Sanchez Felicia Lopez. She is divorced from Rudolfo Lopez and has been married only once. She formerly lived at 3218 Harlandale, but decided to move in with her mother, here at Harlandale in Idaho. Um, she's single, lives in a single wooden dwelling, uh, something, something neighborhood. I don't know why this is important. Um, her name came up in my research. I never connected her to anything of any significance. Maybe she allowed people to stay there. Who the fuck? Uh, maybe that Harlandale address was a safe house. Who knows? Uh, Garrison never clarifies. Uh, in August of 19, looks like 42. Caridad Lopez came from Havana to New Orleans. Um, stayed with her sister's husband in Port Arthur, Texas. Maybe this is connected to Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, came here to help her sister with the children. She stayed at her sister's who met Caps in Cuba while she was, while she was stationed there in military service. She returned to Havana by air via Houston and New Orleans. On September 8th, 1947, she married Rodolfo in Havana, uh, moving with him to New York City on 10th December. Blah, blah, blah. I don't understand the point of any of this. Uh, but obviously, Garrison did. Going into more of her background, again, they're talking about Port Arthur. So maybe for some reason, Garrison was connecting her to Port Arthur which we just talked about moments ago. So this being immediately following that, it seems like there would be a connection there. In 1956, they came back to the United States via Miami, destined for Sarasota. Um, yeah, I'm not really seeing much, much here. The name probably came up somewhere in uh, 
Garrison's investigation in reference to Dallas uh, is what it had to have been. Um, so she probably was an associate or a friend of somebody or knew somebody when they were staying there. That's probably the most uh, that I could say. Um, let me see. They connect this to Sergio Arconcha. So let me pick it up here. During my interview with Subject Lopez, uh, she at no time mentioned the name of the friend in Mexico who sent her the visa and then later supplied the necessary Mexican visa for her, for her to enter the United States. It was a man and he possibly accompanied her to Houston from Laredo. Caridad Lopez did not elaborate on the interim time from 1961 when her son came to the United States to 1964 when she came from when she went from Cuba to Mexico. No records of Sergia Arcacha Smith could be found. However, once Sergia Arcacha was listed as residing at 10746 Lake Gardens. Why is this the next paragraph? In 1964, Arcacha resided at 2274 Spring Hill Drive. His phone number was DA83836. There were not records for him for 1964 and 1960, probably five. It could not be determined who resided here in 1964. In 1963 and 1962, this address was occupied by one Robert Wright, Executive Director, Texas United Fund, Inc. This address was very close to the White Rock Airport. Additional search revealed one Harold McWhorter resided at 2434 Spring Hill Drive. He was employed by Cook Machine Company, 4301 Fitzhugh, as a foreman. He also lived there in 1963. This is mentioned because the White Rock Airport is presently managed by Wayne McWhorter of 39039 Forest Hills Boulevard. Only one Campo could be found in searching the files for 1965 through 1962. In 1962, Benny W. Campo, a salesman for Sherman's Shoes, uh, Preston Avenue, resided at 5620 Alta Further. Uh, Alta. Further checking, it was uh, learned that in 1962, the shoe store was managed by one J.K. Kirkendall, who then resided in Preston Forrester Villate in Richardson, Texas. Investigating the 1966 address of Sergi Arcacha, the 10746 Lake Gardens, the following was ascertained. His telephone number was DA8-5966. This is a four-apartment building in the Lockwood Apartment Complex located near White Rock Lake. This particular building, which was uh, occupied by Arcacha, has four apartments, A, B, C, and D. Arcacha up occupied apartment D, which is one of the upstairs apartments. This particular building is a two-story. The lower half has a uh, buff brick, the upper with gray siding. There is one main entrance service uh, servicing all four apartments. Apartment D rents for $78 per month and has two bedrooms. Uh, living room and dining room, kitchen, bath, no central air or heat, and is unfurnished. Water is free. Other utilities are paid by the other, other tenant. The same apartment furnished with all utilities paid, including central air, would uh, rent for $150. This particular building is six years old. Apartment A is occupied by Mrs. Ursel Bridges. Apartment B is occupied by R.F. Crawford. Apartment C is occupied by Robert Young. And apartment D was found to be vacant on my personal visit. According to the new apartment manager, Crawford and Arcacha were listed as being delinquent in their rent. However, with some reluctance and inquiries, Mrs. Crawford... B and Mrs. Young C advised that Arcacha moved into 9915 Dangle Drive. Mrs. Young and Mrs. Crawford uh, and one of her children, unknowingly to her, identified the photograph of Arcacha. Apparently, Arcacha had not been gone from here very long and still owed some rent. We proceeded to 9915 Dangle Drive, which is approximately two minutes away. This is a single one story dwelling of brick uh, construction in a middle-class neighborhood. There was no activity at this particular address. Parked in the drive facing the street was a blue Pontiac Tempest, license number Texas 1966 KXZ314. Seconds after our arrival, Arcacha drove up in a beige Ford Thunderbird. This vehicle bore license uh, Texas 1966 KXZ108. The driver Arcacha passed our vehicles very slowly, staring at us intently as he passed, continuing to do so until he parked in the drive and inside the house. In comparison to Arcacha's photograph, it was noticed that he had a considerable considerable amount of gray hair, but was still predominantly dark. He was dressed casually wearing a loose-fitting dark sweater and open shirt collar. I then immediately 
uh, phoned Mr. Garrison in New Orleans, advising him of the present location of Arcacha. He advised not to interrogate him, but to continue on with other phase of my mission in Dallas. A specially developed code was used between Garrison and Gervich during this call. En route to White Rock, White Rock Airport, I passed 2274 Spring Hill Drive and found that this was a single one-story dwelling in a middle-class neighborhood. Its proximity to the White Rock Airport is as close as one could get. I interviewed a woman living there, and she advised she had moved in there June 1965. She further stated she had met Arcacha in Dallas shortly before June 1965 at a time when her family was looking for a place to live, and Arcacha advised her that this residence would soon be available as he planned to move. This woman stated that they were renting this home and that Arcacha had done the same. She also, and then it cuts off. All right, and so uh, we made it through about 30 pages. It's about right. Uh, and I think we're going to call it here for today. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, to everybody who tunes in on Kick, I greatly appreciate that. If you haven't uh, followed me there, please do. And all right, guys, we will pick this up tomorrow in the same spot.